How's it going everyone? Welcome to this week's Q&A. So like any other week, if you want a chance that one of your questions is being answered, make sure you do drop a comment down below and I'll try to get to eat each and every question. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the first question and it is, should you be pre-filling your oil filters when doing a oil change? And I know sometimes this gets controversial. I don't know why it's not too big of a deal, but anyways, let's go ahead and answer the question. So uh, if you're changing the oil on your vehicle, and the oil filter is located in a vertical type of position where it just goes down to up and you can screw in nice and neat, then yes, I would absolutely pre-fill it. If you don't, it's okay once again. Now, in my TLX IPS or the J30 AC engine, where it's a horizontal and you're screwing in the filter sideways, if you're gonna pre-fill it, it's just gonna leak everywhere and make a mess. So in that case, I don't do it in that car. On my Pilot, where it's kind of on an angle, I try to pre-fill it. Uh, but again, not too big of a deal. When you start the engine, it'll fill up the oil filter within a second or two, and you'll see the oil light on um, until it does fill the filter, and then you'll be okay. So uh, once again, if it's gonna make a mess and you're gonna get oil over your subframe or your exhaust, or whatever the case may be, even if it's a different manufacturer, then I wouldn't uh, recommend doing it because no one wants to clean up a mess uh, and just make more work for yourself. So a lot of these newer vehicles or even cartridges, which you don't even have a chance to do on that anyways, and again, not too big of a deal. So uh, if you could do it, great. If you can't do it, great. If you wanna do it, great. If you don't wanna do it, great. Just make sure when you start the engine, don't rev it or anything of that nature. You don't wanna cause any problems like that. But other than that, uh, either way is okay with me. So hopefully that answers the question for you. So this next question is mass airflow sensor maintenance. And I know there's a lot of cleaners out there for this stuff, but I've literally never had to clean a mass airflow sensor since they've been introduced into Hondas. Uh, back in the early uh, 2000s um, at any point. The only time I have to go in there is if there is some sort of debris stuck in there. And that in that case, it's not going to clean anyways. You're gonna have to physically take out um, whatever is obstructing the, the, the master flow sensor flow. Uh, so for instance, nine out of 10 times, when I do find an obstruction, it's usually a leaf that's stuck in there whenever you're changing uh, the air filter or maybe the air filter seal isn't um, you know 100% perfect like some of these aftermarket filters and would get past the seal and get stuck on a master flow sensor potentially causing some sort of uh, lean condition uh, just because the master flow sensor isn't reading uh, the metered air it needs to read. Um, recently if you saw my uh, shorts I had an Accord with a battery uh, terminal cover stuck right in front of the master flow sensor. So the master flow sensor was uh, actually uh, covering the, and keeping the, the cover from going into the turbo inlet, which uh, actually saved this person a lot of money because if it made it into the turbo, then it would have caused the wheel to get damaged and potentially blew the turbo. So um, again, uh, nothing that a cleaner is gonna fix. I had to go in there manually and remove the uh, cover itself and the master flow sensor actually ended up saving this person a turbo. So uh, to answer your question, I don't clean any master flow sensors. There's no certain time frame or time period that you have to go in there and do it. If you have a clean um, filter all the time, if you change it every uh, year or every 12 to 50,000 miles, you're gonna be good. Now, if you do live or work in an area where there's a lot of construction and there's a high amount of dirt or dust being created by this dry dirt, then in that case, there may be some uh, dirt particles stuck on it getting past the filter. Usually happens on a cheaper filters. If you have a Honda filter, it's always oiled and it does a great job of capturing all those little particles. So uh, in that case, you might need to go in there, take it out, just blow with some, some uh, compressed air or something along those lines and clean it out that way. But you would normally would see some sort of a uh, wacky uh, check engine light or something happen to indicate that issue. So uh, in most scenarios, I'm gonna completely avoid cleaning mass full sensor and there's absolutely no need for it. So hopefully that answers the question for you. So this next question is why are the injectors on the 1.5T failing? And I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, this is my opinion, that it's a due to low grade or cheap uh, contaminated uh, fuel. I know everyone's out there concerned, uh, you know, uh, with all the prices of everything being up and inflation and, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z fill in a blank. Um, but a lot of times it's uh, from people using low uh, grade fuel or contaminated fuel. Um, if you see the people that usually modify their cars don't have this issue as much as somebody that's, uh, you know, a mom and pop just driving a car around. Um, and also a lot of that is to be, it's just inside the chamber. So it's gonna get a lot more carbon than it should. So 
when you, I take out these injectors and I look at them, the tips are always covered in carbon and they're just not getting cleaned properly. And this is just what's gonna happen. Unfortunately, it is almost due by design uh, from just being a direct injection uh, injector. Back in the day when they were port injected, we never saw felt injectors 99 out of 100 times. Uh, it was always a different issue causing some sort of misfire or lean condition, rich condition, uh, whatever the case may be, they throw all sorts of codes. So uh, I, yeah, I'm just gonna blame it uh, mostly um, due to a uh, low grade or contaminated fu uh, fuel uh, from these uh, low end gas stations. Uh, if you use a higher end fuel, it doesn't typically seem to happen as much. This is what I personally see. Somebody else might be seeing something else out there. Um, now, I was gonna say probably there's some sort of defect in during manufacturing process. That's like their go-to uh, line nowadays. Uh, but I don't, really, I don't really know how true that actually may be. Um, although, once again, when I see higher end cars, for instance, a Civic SI and an Accord will use the same exact part number injector and you don't see uh, SI injector failures like you do see the Accords or the regular Civics. So all use the same type injector, all use the same part number, uh, yet some are failing and the other trims are not. So hopefully that answers the question for you. So this next question is how to deal with NVH vibrations or vibrations while the vehicle is idling, driving, et cetera, felt through uh, from the engine into the chassis. So uh, this person actually has a TLX 2.0 and uh, started noticing the vibration after he replaced his front mount in a core. So on that particular vehicle, uh, they used an Accord 2.0 front mount and he had to modify and cut out the front rate, um, bumper support uh, to fit the new uh, larger inner core and that's when he started to noticing a vibration. So anytime you notice a vibration after you did something, it's probably something you did. So now these aftermarket parts have a lot stiffer rubbers and uh, couplers, uh, bushings, whatever the case may be, and they're just not gonna absorb the vibrations like a normal softer rubber would. So if it happened right after that, then chances are it's something to do with that component or the installation process. Also, if you uh, pinch the mounting rubbers for the front mount, let's say, and it's not sitting in the, the hole properly, then that's gonna give you some additional vibrations as well. You gotta remember, the engine's uh, running is vibrating and the mount's job is to absorb that. So if the mounts can't absorb that, then that's gonna get transferred into the chassis and you're gonna feel it more often. Now, if you have a normal car and just normal circumstances and you're feeling additional vibrations from when a vehicle is newer, it could be from carbon buildup and just the idle being a little bit lower than the target needs to be, and you're just gonna feel more vibrations or some loose or worn engine mounts uh, along with some suspension uh, engine uh, suspension mounts as well, so suspension bushings that may be worn out and you're feeling vibrations through certain conditions or bumps or whatever the case may be. So anytime you're feeling vibrations, um, it's usually due to some sort of rubber not being able to absorb that any longer or a lot of times I see additional vibrations from uh, cars as well that been in a body shop. And uh, typically it's bigger uh, hits. So it'll be something where maybe one of the frames got pushed in a slight uh, quarter inch or something like that. That is very hard to see by a human eye. Although that slight difference now uh, makes all the mounts a little bit tighter. And again, not being able to absorb the way they were intended to be. So in those cases, obviously the proper way to would be to put it on a frame machine. And then I would loosen all the mounts, kind of uh, uh, shake the engine and the trance around a little bit, maybe uh, keep the car in park and just rock it back and forth and let everything uh, stabilize and then retorque everything properly. So uh, that's how I would deal with it personally. Hopefully that answers the question for you. So last but not least, question of the week is what is going on with Honda's uh, build quality? If you guys follow me, you know I posted a couple uh, different recalls recently as well as a lot of uh, issues going on with the newer vehicles and the newest recall affecting multiple Acuras and Hondas with their J series engines uh, with the crankshaft, the incorrect uh, machining or sizing along with the connecting rod uh, bearing. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's going to be a big recall for that. And unfortunately, it even uh, affected my uh, 2019 pilot. And it's just something we have to deal with. Um, as far as uh, what's going on with the quality, um, I just feel like there's a lot of demand from the EPA, the government, um, you know, fuel economy standards, etc., that are putting a lot of pressure on these manufacturers. It's not just Honda. Uh, I'm going to use Toyota here as, as an example, not to pick on them 
and not that I'm, um, you know, supporting or picking on Honda either. I'm just answering the question here. Uh, try to be as unbiased as possible. And I'm using Toyota because everyone uh, uses that as the benchmark against uh, Honda, right? Honda, Toyota, uh, two of the biggest manufacturers in the world and two of the most reliable vehicles in the world, in my personal opinion. But uh, again, going back to Toyota, they have uh, seven uh, recalls, I believe, is on a new Tundra uh, and they had a, a recent recall about a battery coming loose and potentially causing uh, some sort of fire. Uh, also, some brake lines chafing into the uh, fuel lines, also potentially causing a leak of some sort. Uh, so, there's a lot of stuff going on with these vehicles. The more technology they put in these cars, the more chances of something uh, is going to be uh, to break. So, obviously, the more stuff you have, the more bells and whistles, the more chance of something can break. So, that's part of uh, the reason. Uh, the other reason, obviously, what I said already with the EPA, government, uh, fuel economy, and everyone just trying to outdo each other. So, all these manufacturers are competing for your um, for your money and for your purchase. So, they all want to outdo each other with reliability, uh, bells and whistles, you know, et cetera, fill in the blanks. So, uh, Honda's had a lot of recalls recently. A lot of manufacturers have a lot of recalls. Um, I think that, <coughs> um, you know, you can't say certain stuff on YouTube. Uh, I think a lot of that put a strain on the manufacturers as well. Um, so uh, that, I think, is something that can be accounted for as well and a part of the issue. Um, I think a lot of the strikes going on are also part of the issue. Build quality is just a uh, low overall and not just um, Honda. Again, um, I have some inside information from our sister store, um, Toyota, uh, right across the street from us. And uh, they're telling me that the Sequoia, uh, or not, uh, the Tundra turbos and rear main seals are, are blowing left and right. They're having a couple of uh, cases and Toyota's being very hush-hush about it. Um, obviously, I can't prove any of this, but this is just what they're telling me. And, you know, they got no reason to lie to me. Just like I communicate with you guys, they communicate to me and we have an open uh, dialect. But anyways, um, yeah, I just think it's just a lot of different variables. And the majority of the reason being just everyone trying to outdo each other, trying to get your money, your purchase. And obviously, sometimes that backfires on them. So hopefully um, we're going to see start start seeing stuff uh, turn around. Um, obviously, I can't say yay or nay, but I do like that the manufacturers put out these recalls. Uh, obviously, they have to if it's a safety issue, uh, but they're kind of getting, um, you know, checking their, their boxes here, making sure that they're ahead of any potential issues uh, that are coming down the, the line if they're not addressed properly. Now, this uh, bearing issue with these uh, J-Series, they've been going on uh, forever uh, from on the Acura side. I'm, I was kind of surprised to hear about it on the Honda side. I know a couple of you guys said that they've seen a couple of pilots and Odysseys coming in with the uh, Rod Knox. Um, we literally got one the very next day after the recall came out. And it was the first one I seen personally in my dealer. And we do about 150 cars a day. So I was uh, surprised to see that. But, um, you know, sometimes there's stuff I don't know about. There's stuff that I see in my dealer that uh, somebody else doesn't see and vice versa. And we just have to keep an open mind here and just, uh, you know, talk about it, conversate, you know, be adults, have adult conversations. And, uh, you know, eventually, hopefully all this uh, settles down a little bit and we start seeing uh, more, um, you know, reliable uh, vehicles across the manufacturer, not just Honda. But, you know, obviously uh, that's uh, out of my control. I could just do what I could do in my dealership and we try to uh, quality control everything that comes out of there. And even then we sometimes miss stuff as well, but we are, are we're all human. And we try our best and, you know, we just try to catch everything before it becomes an issue. So uh, with that being said, guys, I'm going to end it here and I'll catch you guys on the next one.